Welcome to the third and final part of this three-part series on audio interfaces. In this video, we will be taking an in-depth look at the way audio interfaces work, and we'll explore a few of the technical specifications that might be of interest to you when buying an audio interface or building your first recording rig. If you want to learn more about the basics of audio interfaces or want to understand the connections commonly found on them and the way they can be used, go watch part one and two of this series. So, ready for a deeper dive? Let's get started. In most recording situations, you will be dealing with three types of analog signal levels going into the audio interface. Line level, mic level, and instrument level. Professional audio gear works at line level as standard. Line level signals are the strongest signals used in professional audio equipment, such as mixers, outboard gear, keyboards, and synthesizers. You will usually see line level connections using TRS quarter inch jacks. Any other equipment that does not operate at line level, such as mics and electric guitars, will need to have their signal boosted to that level, and that's where the preamp comes in. The preamp adds gain to weaker signals to boost them up to a usable standard line level. Mic level signals are the quietest of all. They are the signals produced by microphones and will require a lot of preamplification to be boosted to line level. The vast majority of mic level connections use an XLR plug. Instrument level signals are lower strength signals produced by passive electric instruments, mainly electric guitars and basses. They will need preamplification to be raised to line level in order to interface with other studio gear. Additionally, the output of electric guitars, basses and most floor effects pedals have a very high impedance, so they need to be plugged into a special high Z input that can match that impedance. Impedance is quite a complicated electrical subject to explain, so listen to this simple audio demonstration. Here is a guitar plugged in directly to a low impedance line level input. It's not loud enough and there is a loss of high frequency content. Compare this to the same guitar plugged into a high Z input. So if you want to connect your guitar directly to your interface, it needs to have a high Z or instrument labeled input. Instrument level connections are mostly made using TS quarter inch jacks. As is the case with external preamps, audio interface preamps can have varying specs depending on their price range. Better preamps will have a larger gain range, dynamic range or signal to noise ratio and lower distortion, i.e. more gain, better signal to noise ratio and less total harmonic distortion. Also, more expensive preamps will offer much more features such as phantom power for plugging in condenser mics, filters for filtering low-end rumble, polarity reversal switches, pads, and so on. You can find more information about these features in our video on microphone basics. Most of the signals you might want to record, such as vocals, guitars, synthesizers, and so on, are analog signals. In other words, they're continuous electrical signals traveling through your audio cables. Computers can only deal with digital data, which is a series of binary ones and zeros that represent discrete integer numbers. So the analog signals need to be converted into digital somehow, and that's where the analog to digital or A to D conversion comes in. The A to D takes a continuous analog electrical signal and converts it into a discrete digital signal. Discrete meaning that it is made up of a finite number of values. This is achieved by measuring the amplitude of the analog signal at fixed time intervals, a process known as sampling, and then mapping those amplitude values to a predetermined range of discrete integer values that the computer can understand, and this is called quantization. The D to A does exactly the opposite, and thus translates the computer's discrete digital output signals into continuous analog signals you can feed to your speakers, headphones, and so on. The accuracy of this conversion depends on how often it is performed, which is called the sample rate, and how many values are used to represent the amplitude of the analog signal in the digital domain, which is called the bit depth. 44.1 kHz is a standard sample rate for digital audio, such as CDs, MP3s, and so on. 
That means that the A to D samples the analog signal at least 44,000 times a second. Higher values will provide even more accuracy and allow for better results when applying effects such as pitch shifting and time warping later on in your DAW, but will also create much larger audio files and use much more CPU power. Lower values can't accurately represent an audio signal in the range of human hearing and will decrease the fidelity of the digital audio. If you want more info on why this happens, check out the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. In terms of bit depth or resolution, 16 bits is standard for most digital audio. That means that the A to D will map the amplitude level of the analog signal to one of 2 to the 16 or 65,536 discrete digital values. If fewer values are used, the subtle changes in amplitude of the original signal, what is known in music as dynamics, will be lost in its digital representation and it will start sounding like this. More resolution such as 24 bits is also quite standard for recording because it allows for better results when manipulating the dynamics of the signal in your DAW after recording, but it obviously comes with increased file size and CPU and memory usage. So to sum things up, converters sample the incoming analog signals and convert them to digital ones. Their speed and their resolution are the important things to note and your absolute minimum when dealing with digital audio should be 44.1 kHz and 16 bits. The next thing we need to consider is how fast the interface can perform the conversions and transfer data to and from the computer. A metric that could be useful in helping us figure that out is latency. Latency, or more accurately, the round trip latency, is the time it takes between the analog signal hitting the audio interface input and finally coming out of its input. That takes into consideration the time it takes for A to D conversion, transfer to and from the computer, and D to A conversion. You should also note that more latency will also be added to your system because of the time it takes for your CPU to actually process that data and apply complex effects to it. Consider the usual case of singing into a mic through an audio interface while using some cool reverb and delay effects in your DAW and monitoring your singing through your headphones. If the time between you opening your mouth and you hearing your voice through the headphones is, say, one second, it would feel incredibly jarring and potentially make it impossible to perform. So, acceptable latency is measured in the order of milliseconds. In real life, we are used to some sounds reaching our ears immediately, such as our own voices, or with a slight delay, such as a guitarist standing a few meters away from their amp, which would add about 3.3 milliseconds of latency per meter due to the speed of sound. So, the amount of latency that a person might find acceptable to record or perform with varies, depending on whether you're recording instruments or vocals, and also depending on the preferences and experience of the performer. Generally, latency below 10 milliseconds should be very workable, and the more noticeable and annoying issues arise after about 30 milliseconds for most people. So how do you achieve minimal latency? First, you can try to look at the way the interface connects to the computer. A Thunderbolt, for instance, is designed to provide for better real-time transfer of data compared to USB, resulting in very low latency while recording and playing back lots of channels simultaneously. USB might not achieve latency figures as low as Thunderbolt, but still, in cases where fewer channels are used, as in most home recording and podcasting situations, it performs exceptionally well, considering the big price difference between USB and Thunderbolt currently. But this is only part of the answer. Probably the biggest determining factor in how low your latency will be is actually your CPU. So let's talk about how data is transferred between the interface and the computer. The way an audio interface sends the data to the computer is in small packages of samples, which is what we call a buffer. The smaller the buffer size, the less samples are sent to the CPU at once, but they are sent more often. This is very intensive for the CPU, but at the same time results in less latency. If the CPU can't handle the data because it's being sent faster than it can process it, then you will hear glitches and dropouts. Glitches and dropouts. The larger the buffer size, the more samples we send to the CPU at once, but the more time we allow for it to deal with them, while the audio interface is gathering samples to fill up the next buffer. In other words, we are introducing latency while reducing the stress on the CPU. So, sometimes we might have to accept a little bit of latency to give the CPU some breathing space to deal with all that data we are sending to it. You can see that even if your interface can support very low latencies according to the manufacturer, if you're trying to record multiple channels simultaneously while your computer is also trying to do other things in the background such as running your door, various plugins and system tasks, your CPU might not be fast enough to run smoothly at very low buffer sizes. 
So in real life situations, you'll probably experience much higher latency because of the number of tracks you're working on, the number of effects in your door, and other CPU taxing processes running on your computer. And obviously the age and quality of your processor also matters. So be careful when looking up manufacturers' latency figures because they often like to present figures that have been achieved while recording one channel of audio with a very small buffer, such as 32 samples, at very high sampling rates, like 96 kHz. If your CPU can't handle working on these sampling rates and buffer sizes for larger projects, you'll most likely be looking at at least four times the stated latency. Well, that's it for the final video of this series on audio interfaces. Hopefully now you know a lot more about audio interfaces, how they work, and the various specs that are often quoted alongside various products. If you have any outstanding questions about audio interfaces that maybe we didn't cover in these videos, feel free to leave a comment down below and we'll try to answer it as soon as possible. If you found this video useful, please consider giving it a like and of course, subscribe to the channel if you can. That really, really helps us. We also have a podcast on various musical topics that you can check out and the link will be in the description. And hopefully see you on the next video. Bye bye. Thank you.